share some foundational information around audit planning and governance. And then uh, Ghani will come up for 20 minutes to take us through network security and operations while Ifair will now conclude with um, a walkthrough on auditing fiscal network infrastructure. And then he will share some checklists. So I'll say we sit back and um, let's ensure that we take away anything that will distract us from getting something meaningful from our conversation this morning. She. All right, Tony, um, thank you very much. Um, good to be here and good morning, everyone. So today, straight to the point, is just to water your foundational appetite with what we know. And to those that are new, um, just a brief um, concept of what we call um, network or networking. So straight to the point, a, a network is a collection of computers, servers, mainframes, network devices, peripherals, or other devices connected to allow data sharing, basically to um, share resources on the network and data is key, it is key in all. So an example is uh, of this is the internet that we know, which connects millions of people all over the world. Um, to the right is an example of um, a typical connectivity, like it looks like a funny topology, um, an arrangement that's at ball. Uh, we just want to have a caption of everything that can, uh, or to a certain extent, everything that can be presented on the network, which is um, the wireless router on, on my right, and or multi computers and network devices from a normal laptop to workstations, firewalls, modems, switches, and the likes. Why do we have this um, kind of arrangement and connectivity? It's just for us to share um, resources on, on online uh, and what have you. And everything is just either categorized into whether it's a wired network or a wireless network, which goes back to the two different categories of um, arrangement or topology we have. What other things can we say about it that to say network is used to segment or partition an enterprise? Segment an enterprise in the sense that we know how we want, where you, we want data to flow to or information to flow to. So we segment information that should be internal, the one that should be external and the one that should be global. So that is why we always have that composition of intranet, internet and extranet in whatever diagram that we see, which will throw more light to in coming slides. It's also, so the, the, the major thing that we just need to uh, focus on now is that what are the components as a foundational um, reminder? Um, starting with it all, you can see a switch. We have different, we have um, about um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven components that we can lay emphasis on here. And um, starting with the switch, switch switches are networking devices operating uh, a layer two of the OSI model that will be seen in the GFA. And they connect devices in the network and use packet switching to send, receive, or forward data packets or data frames over the network. And it, it, it has many ports. And I know most of us would have seen that in our small office, home office or our enterprise um, land where in our own offices or partitioned offices that we have where we work. What is a router? A router uh, in the likes of the switch is also a networking device that works on the layer three of the OSI model that will be seen. They are responsible also for receiving, analyzing and forwarding data packets among the connected computer networks. When the data packets arrive, the router inspects the destination address, consults its routing table to decide the optimal route and then transfers the packet along this route. In like manner, 
a wireless access point now stays in between, just like you have a router and a switch in the wired kind of architecture. The wireless access point connects traditional wired networks to wireless clients. So this wireless networks provides ease of access to the network for mobile users, increasing productivity while reducing infrastructure cost. A wireless client associates with a wireless network by connecting to the access point and provide the required or necessary routes that we need. Every other one that we have after it are cables referencing the wired network where you join. We all see that in the conduit flowing from the switches straight to your computer, your voice over uh, internet protocol, VoIP phones, there's um, IP phones on your desk, your printers and the like. You always see the RJ45 connector to uh, normal um, cables, uh, 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 cables on, on, online, and these are used on um, um, on the network. So I haven't talked about that, including um, the Wi-Fi and the firewall and all. We cannot but um, uh, make reference briefly to um, what we call OSI layer. The, the, the OSI layer or OSI media uh, model, as it may be called, remains um, um, relevant today. And it's, it contains seven layers from the physical layer, the way you can see on the slide tray to the application layer, um, layer one to layer seven. We are not here to bore you. We just want to let you know that we cannot but take this away because the OSI model is a concept, conceptual framework that describes networking or telecom systems as seven layers, each with its own functions. The layers help networks pro and professionals visualize what is going on within their network and can help network managers narrow down problems. Is it a physical issue or with an application? So basically all that. But in the context of what we have today, and in order to manage our time, we'll be referencing layer one to layer four, which are as uh, area of concentration, talking about the cabling for layer, layer one, switches for layer two, data link layer, the router for layer three, then um, how, what a firewall can do from layer four, probably four to seven in that, in that light, with special reference to layer four. So please just sit back with us and you enjoy the pots the protocols, the devices, and the context of this, um, uh, um, this um, topic as we move straight to auditing um, um, network. So let me just welcome on board um, Antonia Ayana, who, who, who introduced us, um, facilitators, and didn't introduce himself. He's also a veteran in the industry. Tony, just come up and give us, take us through the journey. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Shay. Thank you. Um, network auditing is simply, simply put, is providing assurance and advisory on the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of an organization's network infrastructure. So, beyond uncovering weaknesses in our network, our conversation this morning will be showing us what to do to uncover these weaknesses. We will, as much as possible, share experiences of some of the findings you can have even while auditing network infrastructure. As with every audit engagement, there are fundamental activities you have to perform if you are to be effective as an auditor. Some of these activities include your planning, where you're looking at the number of days, the number of resources that is required for the engagement, ETC. You're also looking at the objectives. Why are you carrying out that engagement? Most of the time is to ensure confidentiality, integrity, and availability of your network infrastructure. Then you're talking about scope. Because time is usually limited, you want to um, create a scope which acts as boundaries for the engagements you're carrying out. So what do you want to look at? Are you looking at network operations? Are you looking at network access control? Are you focused on vendor support and management or configuration management, ETC? Then you will be talking about information or data gathering. Some of the artifacts that you will require for your analysis, 
um, to make informed opinion around those things that speak to your objectives. And finally, you now have to carry out the test of control, which is the testing some of those things that you have identified um, in your information request list. Speaking now, these are some examples of some of the things you'll be requiring. An organogram for the team managing the network. Why this is important is that you want to even see how the people who are managing the network. Here, you are looking at their job descriptions. You're looking at how, if they are even skilled to carry out the, the job they are doing at the moment. You're looking at network risk assessment. You're asking for the network risk assessment report, which speaks to some of the risks that have been identified in the management of the network. What mitigating controls have been put in place to manage those risks. Then you're looking at policies, procedures. Some of these speak to the governance around the network, which we'll be speaking to in a bit. A network diagram is crucial, is a crucial requirement that you will be requiring in carrying out your assessment. Why? It lays out, a, provides you with a logical diagram of how your network has been architected. There's a wealth of information that you can extract from a network diagram. Things like if redundancies have been implemented, segmentation has been implemented, ETC, where certain assets have been placed on the network. Inventory of assets, just this morning I saw a post on LinkedIn um, where someone was saying that uh, he, he likened the lack of knowledge of your inventory to somebody who is walking blind or somebody who has been blindfolded. You know, you cannot protect what you don't have. And so if you do not know what your network assets are, the likelihood that you will be able to be effective effectively protect those assets is seen. So that again is an important requirement for your engagement. Then you have inventory of tools utilized for network management. You want to see that they're properly configured, things around um, vendors, support and management, and then your internal and external penetration tests. Now this is an important exercise which every organization should engage in because it's in an automated way, it gets to show you some of the vulnerabilities that exist on your network. Before I go into governance, which basically is set the tone for our engagement, I think it's important that I highlight two things which are quite interrelated. One is the fact that implemented controls will be organization specific. Implemented controls will be driven by risk appetite or a business need. While it is important that we align our, while aligning with international best practices are good and important, and you have tons of them, international practices, best practices from NIST, ISO 27001, PCI DSS, for those of us who are familiar with the CAD environment, your controls should be specific to your organization. Like I said earlier, implemented controls should be organization specific. Now, this specificity, right, for lack of a better word, is tied to the governance of the institution. So, you have things like policies, procedures, regulatory requirements, hardening standards, and vendor support. All of these make up governance. And governance is simply saying, how do I intend to manage my network infrastructure? That's what he's saying. These things that we have just listed, your policies, procedures, ETC, are like tools that help me manage my network infrastructure. So a policy, for instance, are like high level, um, are like high level uh, statements that informs or defines how we manage the network. So for example, I can say, Anybody who wants to access the network must access it with unique credentials, right? That could be a policy statement. A procedure, on the other hand, is a detailed illustration of your day-to-day -day activities. They are more like, they provide details on how these policy statements are implemented. Now, depending on the industry you're in, you may have regulatory requirements that guide how your network should operate. Again, depending on your client, UK, US, there are certain regulations that you see, some of them from 
um, NCNC, CISA, ETC. Uh, if you are in banking here in Nigeria, the CBN is likely going to come up with some regulations on how you guide your network. It's important that you are able to comply, right, with some of these, um, these requirements. Someone is likely going to say, why are these important, right? Why are these important? As an auditor, these things, they are the foundation on which every security posture is built. What you document or record, um, what you don't document or record, you're likely going to struggle to measure, right? And for us as tech risk practitioners, they act as our criteria for the assessment. Don't forget, like I said earlier, your implemented controls are likely going to be specific to your organization. Now, a deviation from any of these criteria that has been spelled out in your procedures and in your policies, right, while you're testing your controls are what constitutes a finding or an exception in your audit report. So again, you need these policies, procedures, hardening standards, whatever they may be, because you want to ensure consistency in the implementation of security across your network. Recall that I said that the, these, these governance documents are like the foundation on which your security posture is, um, is built. Now, without these documents, what you see is that people will be working based on their own personal interpretation of some of these things. So if your organization does not have policies or procedures, it has to be the first advisory service that we are providing. We need to ensure that those things are put in place. And that key governance document will be your service level agreement. These are your, these agreements or contracts as the case may be, are what you use to hold your third party network providers accountable. So be it an OEM or an ISP or say a, a link provider, we need them. I'll just share with us a sample of what you um, typically call a network security policy. It should have a purpose, a scope, responsibilities, and then some of the, um, the tenets in that document, depending on what it covers. I have briefly spoken about procedures and their importance because they ensure consistency in daily operations. Um, some institutions may have configuration standards and policies merge together. In some places, they are separate. So if you can see my screen, I know this is a bit tiny, you will see that for this fire config, firewall configuration standard, it highlights things like, um, and this is just a sample. It talks about the, the, the list of ports that for, um, for instance, you shouldn't have open, that should be blocked, you know. Um, again, these are some of the things that ensure uniformity across your, your your devices. And then um, finally, I was briefly talking about SLA. Some of the things you want to check out for in your SLA will be the validity of the SLA. Now, it's important that at least you have a contract with your third party service providers. Without that contract, you're exposed as an institution. It becomes very difficult for you to hold your vendors accountable. So if you don't have an SLA, that is a finding. Beyond having an, um, not having an SLA, if you even have an SLA, you want to test for validity. Has the SLA expired, depending on the time frame of that contract? Have service levels been defined by both parties? What are the responsibilities of the um, network service provider? Has it been clearly spelled out? What are my re responsibilities to in this contract? right then you need things like your right to audit and then penalty clause now for penalty clause i know there are debates here and there depending on the climb you're in uh, i i reviewed a bank in the uk and penalty clause is not something that they are so big on maybe because of the trust level they have with their vendors but in developing countries is a big deal because you need a way to hold the vendor accountable now uh, the objective is not to penalize the vendor for service failure because every service failure you have impacts your customers. The whole idea is to have something to hold that should in the event that these things happen, I can hold them accountable. If you own a Cisco device on your network, 
part of what you want to be requesting for will be your smart net like um contract and for smart net on your from you, you request for that from your network administrators now those that smart net is an indication that that device is supported if they are not supported if you don't if they don't have a smart net to provide for the device which is also paid for it means that patches will not be provided fixes will not be provided by, by the oem to address known and exploitable vulnerabilities so at this point i'll call on ganiu to take us through auditing network operations and security i hope we're doing well on time thank you Ganiu. okay tony and the team thank